simplify your Amazon sourcing analysis with a tool called SellerAmp. So SellerAmp is a tool that I've been using for a long time and I use it every single day in my business. It makes my life 10 times easier because it helps me answer the three key sourcing questions. One being, can I sell it? Two being, does it sell at all? And three, is it profitable? So in addition to telling me things like how many units per month I can expect to sell and how much profit I'm gonna make, I can also use SellerAmp to source wholesale catalogs all within one screen, so I don't have to leave my Google Sheet, I don't have to have any other tools. Uh, SellerAmp, the Chrome extension, makes it super easy to do all of my sourcing there within my Google Sheet. So if you wanna check out SellerAmp for yourself, head over to selleramp.com slash GANIM and use code GANIM, all caps, G-A-N-I-M, for 50% off your first month or use the code GANIM annual, also all caps, for 5% off your first year. So head over to selleramp.com slash GANIM, use those codes and let me know what you think of the tool. All right, welcome back to this week's episode of the Amazon Wholesale Podcast. So the guest with me this week is Keith. You might know him from Twitter as Keith underscore FBA. Keith was a professional gamer turned full-time Amazon seller. He started with OA. Now he's doing mainly wholesale to the tune of about 250K to 300K per month. He's absolutely crushing it and he's less than two years into the game. And Keith also happens to be a member of my mastermind community, which is where seven and eight figure wholesale sellers like myself and folks like Keith spend most of our time. So Keith, thank you so much for coming on the podcast, man. I'm really looking forward to digging into your business your journey and just hearing about uh, what you're working on. So thanks for coming on, man. Yeah. So first off, thanks for having me. You know, pleasure to be here. Yeah, absolutely. So let's dig into one of the things that I mentioned in the intro, right? So you were previously a professional gamer. Now you're a full-time Amazon seller. So I think that, well, one, personally, that's really interesting to me because I've always been in the gaming pretty much my whole life. Um, Never was very good. So, you know, playing like at a professional level is just like, unheard of for me and for really anybody that I knew. Um, but it's it's a fun hobby of mine and a fun hobby of probably a lot of people that are listening to the show. So let's start there. How did you get into gaming as a profession, first of all? Well, like everyone else, I'm sure everyone had an, a hobby or addiction. Um, for me, it was games you know, ever since, you know, eight years old. That's that's where I started, actually. You know, it's just been an addiction from there. And for most people, it kind of fizzles out after, you know, once you start taking school seriously. But for me, I just happened to get so good, not taking any credit. I just spent way too much time. You know, I sacrificed a lot of social, um, social like op- like social obligations. Um, I was an awkward kid in high school. Still am, <laughs> honestly, still am. But um, turned out to be like kind of skilled and one thing came led to another and um I, instead of pursuing school um kind of just competed there in that scene for about six years and once i realized that you know it didn't make so, so much sense um mainly because of job insecurity you know it's very it's very cutthroat industry like every year you'll get a contract some players might not get a contract right it's without getting too complicated it's uh it's not the most secure job so that's when i started that's when i found amazon um kind of just browse YouTube videos and wanted to know how to make money online because I didn't have a degree, right? So I'm coming off of gaming. I can't really say much things translate over to other, I want to say like real jobs, I suppose. And the one thing that does translate is work ethic though. Mm -hmm. And, you know, to be at that level, you know, there's a requirement. You have to put in the time. Right. for me, it was like 14 to 16 hours a day, nonstop. Jeez. So it was it was brutal. I mean, it's pretty similar to uh, most people have done athletics. It's pretty similar to that, except when it's a video game, you know, you don't really get the same like. You're able to put in so many more hours, right? You're just right, sitting you at a desk. You, just, you don't have the limit as much, like the physical limit. So you can just play, 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 play. play. It's like, it's, you know, it's it's it, it was exhausting, but it was it's also fun. Like it's every kid's dream. So I'm happy about it. So, and what was your game? What was the game that you competed in? It's called League of Legends. Do you still play for fun at all ever? Or is it pretty much like completely in your past at this point? Uh, I don't play anymore as of recently. I think it's been maybe half a year since I've played. It's, to, to be honest, I don't have much time to play anymore. Plus, it's it's pretty hard to enjoy a game casually as something you used to play professionally. I don't know if anyone, it's probably not many people can speak about this, but I, I don't know if, you know, 
I feel like it's hard. Like maybe an NBA player would find it hard to just play like a random pickup game of basketball. Like it's their <laughs> job, you know? Right. They're, like they have to be the best, right? They're not going to play some random game on the street. And they might. But I think for me, it's like, it's it's kind of tough. Like it's always, for me, it's like, it's a mode. It's, uh, I have to be, I have to win, you know, I'm super competitive in this game. It's pretty hard to be casual about it. Yeah, no, that makes sense. That's interesting. Well, and just one more question about the gaming side of things, really more so just because I'm curious. So you said that some players might get a contract each season, some players might not. What do those contracts entail? And like, you don't have to get into the actual numbers, but is that just a, hey, we're going to pay you a monthly amount just for representing our organization? Or did that involve like streaming obligations? What did What did that entail as far as that contract is concerned? So a typical contract will last one to three years. And there are, so for some organizations, there are streaming obligations. So you would have to put in a certain number of hours uh, as agreed on the contract. And of course you got like these organizations, you know, they pay these players a salary, it's expensive and they have to make their money somewhere. So, you know, advertising, um, sponsorship, like merch, merchandise, like whatever they can do to monetize their players, you, have, you kind of have to agree to that, right? Um, and, and so, I mean, really, so the nature of it was in, in the league that I was in, it's, it's called the LCS and there were only 50, there were only 50, I want to say like good spots. These are like, there were only 10 teams at the time. I think it's changed now, but, and there are five, the game is a five player game. It's two teams of five playing against each other. So there are only 10 starter spots. No, sorry, 50. There's only 50 starter spots in the country that are good, right? So it's people are fighting over and over against on these spots, right? And spots like in the tier two, tier three, like they don't pay well. Like right. they're they just that's just how it is, you know. If you're not tier one, you don't you don't get paid well, right? So um, that's why it's very tough to get. It's very tough, really, to get a tier one spot. I mean, if you are tier one, um, you are going to get paid pretty. pretty Pretty good you'll get your housing paid for most of the time you get your food paid for so it's a good experience but again there's only 50 spots and you can imagine how competitive it is yeah no that's super interesting so it sounds probably similar to like baseball right where like if you're in the minors you're making next to nothing but if you're in the mlb like even even the worst players of the mlb are making a lot of money were you and this again just out of curiosity were you a tier one player or were you tier two tier three I was on and off. I would say in my career, I was like 30% tier one and then 30%, 70% tier two. That's like nice. off of my memory. So, I mean, I was always going up and down, um, but it was, I wasn't like crazy or anything. I wasn't like a world like champion, uh, champion of the country or anything, but uh, I was, it was still, I was still competitive for those tier one spots. Gotcha. Well, yeah, that's super interesting, man. So, and I mean, you said that there, there are not a lot of, carry over between like being a professional gamer and traditional real world jobs and i would probably agree when making the comparison between like gaming and like traditional jobs but when you make the comparison between that profession and a, a business like being an amazon right i do see a lot of comparison because i mean you said it yourself back when you were a professional gamer you were having to put in those 14 16 hour days just to stay competitive right that's not even necessarily to like get better than people that's kind of just to stay at at the level of everybody else and that's not to say that building an amazon business requires you to work 16 or 8 like you know 14 16 hours a day it definitely doesn't now if you want to you're probably going to make progress a lot faster than somebody who's only working one or two hours per day but the concept is the same in the sense of you've got to put in the work every single day day in day out for a long time before you had the luxury of maybe taking a little bit of a step back and either hiring people to do some of that work for you or just generally taking your foot off the gas. Would you agree there, at least from the Amazon perspective? Yeah, no, 100%. And I think it's the reason why a lot of people who did sports back then is say it's an easy transition. And I, I agree with that thought too. I mean, it's it's really, you know, it's a, it's a mindset thing. It's like to be an Amazon, or even accessible a successful Amazon seller, like no one really has like crazy skills or anything. It's just people put in the time. You got, got to learn the process, and that's it. That's really it. There's nothing more, much more to say about it. That's such a good point, and that's something I want to kind of touch on a little bit because I I put out a tweet the other day, maybe it was an email, something along the lines of 
like there are some really and this is no offense to anybody i was just using this example kind of to to illustrate a point but it's like listen there's some dumb people out there making a lot of money on amazon right now when i say dumb i'm talking people that either they didn't go to school they don't have a degree or, or by society standards aren't the smartest people out there there are a lot more people out there that are way more qualified than them yet they're doing better on amazon than some of these guys that come into the business with like an mba you know have an mba degree or like decades of corporate experience and they're getting just the these the dumb guys are wiping the floor with these corporate guys because of the fact that like you said they're willing to put in the work they're willing to admit when they're wrong they're willing to learn and adapt from the constantly changing marketplace which as we know this is whereas sometimes the more quote unquote educated people or the quote unquote smarter people have these preconceived notions about what's required or they think they know the, the way to do things and at the end of the day this is a very unique business and while some skills and some experience translates the the main thing that translates is the work ethic because it's just such a nuanced unique business right yep 100 percent agreed so let's dive into your business as it stands today so you told me before the call you've been selling for almost two years now right and i think you said you're doing about at this point about 80 percent wholesale 20 percent oa whereas for a while there you were majority oa and, and looking to add wholesale to your business so how did you go about making that transition from largely oa a little bit of wholesale to now majority wholesale and a little bit of oa so the transition started um in 2023 middle of 2023 when i kind of started feeling i was not really hitting the ceiling but feeling like my times my time input is not worth um the output of oa itself because of a lot of complexities order cancels lots of purchase management it gets it's just a headache and and so I did some of my own research on wholesale because, you know, it's kind of similar, right? Um, you're just spending money reselling other people's products. Um, but instead of a website, you go through a distributor or a brand. Right. And kind of how I did it was first, you know, I did some of my online research. And well, going back to how I kind of scaled away, uh, I took Fields of po Profits um, coaching program, mm -hmm. um, which definitely like helped me a lot. It, it bridged the gaps of my knowledge, like knowing best practices, SOPs, you know, what sites are good, how do I, how do I, how do I start a team? Right. That's that's where I got my first hire. My first few hires is is when I when I was still doing OA. And I mean really the way I transitioned to wholesale is kind of the same way I transitioned from um well really from when I was doing only around 20k a month OA to uh, around 100 k a month OA. Mm -hmm. And how to describe it is you're standing and you want to make the hop, you make you want to make the leap to wholesale but you're keep for me i'm just keeping one foot in at the whole time like you're dipping your toes in mm -hmm. you know slowly you know it's taking months you know you do your research you know spend a little time building uh, a distributor list a brand list you know making these calls getting uncomfortable you know everyone's got to do that like you got to do what other people aren't willing to do um so really just kept doing oa didn't never stopped oa just always kept spending and in the meantime i was i had i was hiring my team to handle you know the sourcing for me so that i could put more time in the wholesale and you know i would say like and we're still doing a good amount of oa right now and we're doing wholesale right now so it was just a very like slow transition never you know i never been in ship or anything yeah well and i love that you made that point right because i think that's a big fear that a lot of sellers make that are currently doing another model whether they're doing online arbitrage or retail arbitrage or private label and they're looking to get into wholesale i think a lot of them mistakenly believe that oh i've got to just abandon my oa business or i've got to just you know kill my private label brand if i make the transition into wholesale which is totally not the case right i mean especially like you said you based on your exact experience you just got in a little bit at a time it's like like you said kind of testing the waters right but continuing to keep your oa business going because it was making you money so it's like why shut it down if it's if it's making you money like why stop doing anything that's making money right and instead just look to expand the scope of the business by kind of like you said adding a creating a list of suppliers that you'd be interested in and in working with right and adding to it over time and maybe reaching out to a couple of suppliers per week 
not doing anything drastic, not reaching out to, you know, 30 suppliers per day to try to fully make the transition, but just doing a little bit at a time. So I think that's a great point there. And, and honestly, I think that's the way everybody should make the transition, right? Unless you are trying to start with wholesale from the beginning, then there's no reason to jump right in from what you're already doing. Look to add it a little bit at a time, right? Yep, 100% agreed. So when it comes to your the wholesale side of your business, so like you said, you're, you're doing about, I think you said about 250, 300K a month in revenue right now, about 80% of that is wholesale. So when it comes to the wholesale side, what is the breakdown? Is it, are you buying mainly from distributors? Are you working directly with any brands? How does your wholesale business function from that perspective? So as of right now, we're all distributors. Uh, we're looking to move away from that as soon as possible. Um, well, not away completely, but we're trying to pivot into brand direct, um, brand direct suppliers. And mm -hmm. you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna transition into that the same way I've done it um, into wholesale and OA is you know join your community as well, which helps a lot with trans making this uh, transition. And it's not I get uh, it is it is different for me um, going from distributors to brands. It's for me, the, the way I see it is distributors only care about your money right. and how much you spend, and brands care about the value you bring yep. as, a, as a partner. So that's that's the kind of mindset I've been shifting to, where like I'm not just going to spend money. I'm I'm trying to develop like the company's like positioning and right. value the value we bring. So that's that's something that we're working on right now. Well, I think that's super smart, and it's exactly right. I mean, you you pretty much took the words out of my mouth when you said distributors only care about how much money you're going to spend, which is exactly right. And brands want to know how are you going to partner with them to help them grow, right? Brands don't just need another reseller because at the end of the day, there's always going to be somebody out there that can outspend you. So you approaching a brand and saying, hey, we can place a 20, 30, 50, $100,000 order well, they're just going to say, okay, great. Well, so can, you know, the other three guys that called me this week, what are you going to do that they can't, right? So, and kind of like asking you that exact question, what is your plan as far as positioning yourself to some of these brands? How do you intend to help them grow um, being on the newer side of this? And my goal here is not to put you on the spot, but I think that a lot of people listening to this particular episode are probably in the same boat, right? They're either doing wholesale and they want to add a brand direct component or they want to transition to wholesale and they see working with brands as being the best way to do it so maybe from like a newer brand direct wholesale seller perspective what's the approach that you're taking to kind of pitch these brands and get them locked down so my number one um pitch to brands that i'm working on right now is to get them on other channels off not on amazon um specifically TikTok. Mm -hmm. If they are on that channel, will help increase their 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 presence. If they're not on the channel at all, then we you know we'll launch them. You know we're we'll we're gonna do the same thing as Amazon. We'll we're gonna buy wholesale from them. We'll make you know marketing these short form content videos to increase awareness of this brand and you know drive sales overall. That's that's the wrong goal for me or for us. And so do you have, it sounds like, and I think you do based on what we've discussed within the mastermind, but do you have that experience with TikTok shop? I think you said you do, right? Um, I, yeah, so we are actually getting like a handful of sales every week um, without really, we haven't really done anything yet, but actually my girlfriend is very experienced in TikTok. And so she'll be helping me, you know, make the videos for these products. And I don't have personal experience in the marketing in like the, in the TikTok side of things, but um, I am in the, of course, I'll be managing like the inventory and make sure like, okay, do we have the inventory? We got to send it to our, our prep center. And of course it's not, it's a different kind of model. I think um, it's going to be, most orders will be sent from um, my warehouse to the customer instead of like an Amazon FBA model. So right. yeah, I'll be handling the logistics of course. And I'll have my, my girlfriend who is going to be handling like the marketing and the video creation. Well, I think that's a huge value add to bring to brands, right? Because I mean, TikTok is this shiny object, especially since they launched TikTok shop. A lot of these brands are thinking to themselves like, well, we know we need to be on TikTok shop, but we don't know how to do it. Right. And now, even though, I mean, you said yourself, right, you're not an expert in TikTok shop. In fact, it's not like you're doing, you know, tens of thousands of dollars per month in revenue there. But what's important is that of probably 95% of the brands that you're going to pitch, 
you know more about TikTok shop than they do, right? Even if that means you've only made a couple of sales there, that's a couple more sales than they've made themselves. So that's a lot. To, that's oftentimes the advice that I give to newer wholesale sellers that are looking to go the brand direct route just in general, whether they're pitching TikTok, whatever they're pitching to the brand, they don't need to be an expert in it. They just need to know more than the brand knows, right? And a lot of these brands know nothing about Amazon. I mean, my, my first handful of profitable wholesale accounts were directly with brands this was back in 2019 where you know i'm on the phone giving them this pitch about how we can help them grow and i know like i know the gist of it but i'm no expert like this is the first brand i'm pitching but the what mattered is that i knew more than the brand and i could convey it in a way that that where they understood and they were willing to give me that opportunity so that's kind of Again, the words of encouragement to people listening to this, you don't need to be an expert on Amazon. You don't need to be like a 10 year veteran. You just gotta be one step ahead of the brand. And that's why a lot of these smaller brands in particular, there's huge opportunity because some of these bigger agencies aren't targeting them because they're too small. So that could be a really good way to get your foot in the door, get a couple of good case studies and uh, look to expand from there. And I love just to further touch on your point about like, your main pitch is gonna be getting them on other channels, right? That's a really good pitch to a lot of these brands because they're hearing the same thing day in and day out. It's like, oh, well, we can run ads or we can optimize your listings or we can do this, or we can do that to help you grow on Amazon. But very few sellers are contacting these brands and saying, hey, well, we can help you grow on Amazon, sure, but we can also help you grow these other channels, which is a skill set, which is an entirely separate skill set in and of itself. Um, so have you found that approach to be to, to work so far? Have you gotten good feedback from some brands? Like, do you have a good pipeline? Uh, I only really started reaching out to brands like around two weeks ago. I think the, the response rate has been good so far. Nice. Um, of course, it's going to take, I, I think it'll take, you know, a lot of few months. You know, of course, we want to build up some, how do you say, like trustworthiness, you know? Right. We probably will, of course, need to make our own content, build a following, you know, on, also on Instagram as well. Um, we are also trying to pitch like the Amazon, you know, channel like li optimizing listings and PPC, but TikTok is going to be the main thing for us. But um, I'm still confident. I'm I'm very early into this stage, so I'll have to I'll have to uh, reevaluate in like three months. See see how 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 we're doing. Yeah, well, I mean, to only be two weeks in, and like again, I I saw in the Discord you were posting. Are you asking some really good questions about like certain brands that you're in conversations with? I'm like, hey, is, is this brand a good fit? Is this one not? So you're totally on the right track. I mean, two weeks in, way too early to tell, like you said, but this is one of those things where, I mean, look at guys like Jonah, look at guys, you know, other folks in the community there that are are doing brand direct on a large scale. It's, it's a, you know, six month to 12 month process as far as like nailing down your pitch, building up a good pipeline, because I mean, you know, as well as I do, the best brands are going to take six to 12 plus months to close. So you're totally on the right track with that. Yeah, and I'm fully like I'm. I'm already bought into the idea that I'll I'll be following it for years if it takes that long. <laughs> yeah, with these brands. So that's that's how I'm I'm how I'm seeing it. Yeah, well, and that's and again, you've got the right mentality. You've obviously got a strong pitch, so it's just a matter of time at this point. Now let's talk about your like your participation on social media. We mentioned the fact that you're uh, part of my mastermind community. We'll touch on that here shortly, but let's talk about Twitter, right? So for those of the listeners that didn't hear my my plug for your Twitter at the beginning of the episode, I believe you're Keith underscore FBA. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Now, what has being on Twitter like done for your business and for your network? Has it helped you? Has it hurt you? I think I know the answer here, but uh, like, what's been your experience being on social media? Uh, to be honest, ninety percent has helped me um, since I joined last year. Um, I didn't I didn't really see a point like making Twitter, but I figured why not. Um, but really, like a lot of the benefit is just seeing how other people think, and you'd be surprised. Mm -hmm. Like, why would people post? Why would people want to post? Like, how they think or like leak any strategies? But you can definitely like you can learn a lot just from being on Twitter as a new seller. Um, even I'm still learning stuff today um, here and there, just just by browsing my feed. And you know, this the community is awesome. Like everyone will just post like any helpful tip that they see. Oh, of course, you call the right people, <laughs> right. but uh, like Corgano, for example. <laughs> but um, yeah, if, if you choose, if you follow the right people, like you can get a lot of free information, and there's just so much of it right now. 
Yeah, there really is. I mean, there's just so much good stuff out there on Twitter. So, and to give people a background on like my journey on social media. So those of you that maybe haven't been following me for that long, I only started posting on social media about my business and about my journey, I think January of 2023. So just over a year ago now, this is March 25th of 2024 that we're recording this. And I mean, honestly, that was one of the most common questions that I got when I was starting to get more active. If people would DM me and say like, hey, this is great information, but like, why like why would you share this like why why are you sharing this openly you know there are competitors here on twitter people that could find your storefront like why are you giving away all your secrets more or less and i'm like listen the way i see it is there's so much more upside to being transparent about your journey on social media than there is downside like okay yes there might be a very minuscule downside of oh some guy finds my storefront and then maybe he jumps on two of the listings that i'm on right okay that sucks but it's not the end of the world when in reality, the upside is, well, hey, now I, ever since I started posting on social media, I've met, you know, 50, 70, 100 people that I've gotten to meet in person, that I've gotten to know, that are now customers of mine, friends of mine, business partners of mine. Like the upside just so, so far outweighs the downside that it's just, it's a no brainer, right? But like with anything, it takes being consistent. So it's not enough just to kind of show up post a couple of times, DM a couple of people and then dip, you've got to be, you've got to be consistently, at the very least, you've got to be consistently present, right? That doesn't mean you need to be like putting out content every day, but at least be talking to people, replying to people, liking tweets, that type of stuff. I mean, would, would you agree? Because I know you're not like, you're not like out here posting every day. In fact, I don't think you've posted for a good while, but like you're on Twitter, you're liking posts, you're responding, like you're active, like people know you exist. Is that fair to say? Yeah, and I definitely am not like the the best social media person. Like, I'm actually awful at like making tweeting in general. But uh, at the very least, all I did was post sales. And if you got if you got the orange bars, you know people will notice eventually. Yeah, right. right. If, you, if you see, you know, post your post your first sale. Um, people will like that. Post your when you're at 10k, when you're at 20k, 50k. Like people will notice. Right. That's all. Really, it doesn't take much thought. Just screenshot on your phone. Like you put in the work, people will notice. Right. And immediately, like, you will. I think. I think the reward will come if you put in just that little amount of work, like, barely anything, you know. Yeah. Well, no, you're you're so right. Like it, it, it's like almost it's almost like laughable how little effort it takes, but it it's the fact of like sitting down to do it, and that's something that I've been trying to get a lot better about. So, for example, on Instagram, it's like I post. We post I think like twice a day on Instagram, but I'm really bad about putting up stories. And that's something that like i want people to get more of an insight into my day to day and it's like i'm doing so much stuff every day but it's just the simple thought of like the kind of training myself to get into that thought process of oh well hey i just sent this email to the supplier let me just take a quick picture of it and like write out a little caption and put that on my story right and just so that people know kind of like why i did this and it, it might help somebody else you know maybe craft their email to a supplier and it's just thinking along those lines whether it's twitter whether it's instagram whatever just kind of getting into that habit of kind of like Gary Vee says, like document, don't create, right? Just literally just like document what it is that you're doing on a daily or a weekly basis. And I think that goes so far. And there's a guy, I swear, I can't remember his last name. I, his first name is Brian. He might be like Brian FBA on Twitter. And honestly, I haven't seen him on the timeline in quite a while, but he was, he's a guy, this was probably like around when I started on social media, he was like brand new to Amazon, like completely new. I think he knew to e-commerce and he just started posting, I think like maybe once or twice a day, like one or two tweets a day. And they, it was like super wholesome because he was like so new to the process, but he was just sharing what he was doing. He said, Hey, like I just bought, you know, seven, seven units of this product from Walmart on clearance. I bought for $3. They're going to sell on Amazon for $16. Uh, and now I've got to figure out how to ship it in. This is really exciting, like good day, right? And they were all tweets like that. He'd be like, hey, I'm working through my first shipment. It took me three and a half hours, but this is what I learned. And I think the next one's going to be easier. And it's like, the you know, at first he wasn't really getting any traction because he was new. But after like a couple of weeks, like people started to catch on and his tweets were like, he was getting a ton of love. And he, I mean, he got like a thousand followers pretty quickly. Ton of people replying, like encouraging him saying, man, you're crushing it. Like, keep it up. And like that is the that's exactly how it's done. Like textbook example, 
like I said, I think he's at Brian FBA on Twitter. So shout out to him because he's a great example of exactly how to do that. But again, I know we kind of got off on a tangent here, but I, it's just so important. Like being, being active in the community is critical for growing much quicker than you would otherwise. Would you say so? Yeah, no, 100% agree. I think if I hadn't made the choice to go on Twitter, I don't know where I'd be right now. Definitely not where I'd, definitely lower than, um, worse off than, than I am now, for sure. Uh, oh, me too. I mean, that's, and I, I've said this before on, on previous episodes, but I was over five years into my Amazon business before I, basically, let me put it this way. I was five years into Amazon and I could count on one hand the names of other sellers that I knew. I knew my buddy Philip, who's now part of the mastermind community. I knew um, a guy named Derek, second guy. And I think they were the only two people that I knew by name, other Amazon sellers like in the entire country. And I've been selling for five years. So definitely the, like, honestly, the best decision I've made in my business was, was getting active on social media. So for those of you listening that aren't doing that yet, it's tough at first, but just do it for a little bit of time. It'll help. So we touched on the social media side of things. Now let's talk about the the mastermind community, right? That you joined uh, just about just over a month ago. And so for those listening to this, I haven't done a lot of marketing when it comes to this community. It's been pretty pretty much invite only for a while. You are going to hear me talking about it more here in the coming months because it's something that we're looking to grow. Um, but you came on. You didn't. I don't think you had. I think Jonah is probably the one that you talked to. Kind of got you in there. And so you've been in for about 30 days and this is just like, I just want to get your feedback here on the podcast of like, how has being in our mastermind community helped you in your business? And I'm not, you know, I, for context for folks listening, like I didn't tell them to like answer this a specific way. I wanted to give an honest, honest feedback on like what being part of a mastermind of 42 is successful wholesale sellers. Like what has that done for your business? Uh, most of all, it's just been really refreshing. Um, I've bought quite a few, courses actually um to help my amazon business and you know it's a it's a group of seven figure amazon wholesale sellers and it feels like everything that i read in the group is very very like interesting and applicable to me at some point mm -hmm. like at, in, at some point at some level um even if i'm not participating i'll i'll read it and be like Oh wow, this is might be use, really useful for me in the future, right? Because it's you know I am very involved in wholesale, so um, that and of course you know we are very we're making we're trying to make like a very hard pivot pivot into brand direct wholesale, and I mean that's kind of how how I joined anyway. I wasn't really planning on joining a group this year because I've done it last year a lot. Uh -huh. uh, I, I kind of spoke with Jonah uh, about I had a brand direct question, and he kind of just like said like Hey, this this is what this is who we are. We're we're the Amazon wholesale community, and if you want to join. You know, we'll, we talk a lot, a lot about brand direct, so that's why I joined. So, and so far, it's been very, very helpful. You know, if I'm ever having an issue, um, I'm I'm very confident I'll land my first brand direct deal um, because of this group. Oh, 100 percent. Well, and you also like you ask really good questions too in the group. So it's kind of like you can kind of tell whether or not somebody's going to be successful just based on the types of questions that they ask. And as soon as you got in there, you were asking really good questions like from day one. And I'm like, yeah, this guy's going to crush it. So um, totally not going to be surprised when you land that first one. So that's good stuff. All right. So I'm curious about like the structure of your business. So you mentioned your girlfriend, which it sounds like she kind of just helps you maybe on the TikTok side. But when it comes to like actual partners in the business, like equity partners, is it just you? Like, is this pretty much a one man show? Or do you have some folks that are helping you out that are like more equity partners in your business? So I own 100% of the business, no partners. Okay. I do have a team of four VAs. Nice. One is an admin and I have three sourcers. They Right now they mainly source OA products and I have one of them is a, a purchaser as well. So they'll do the, They'll do the buying, you know, go to the site and buy this many units on the retailer website. So on the OA side, it's it's around ninety five percent outsourced. And meanwhile, I'm fo as of right now, I'm focusing like ninety five percent of all my time into going to the brand direct and making the transition to other sales channels. And um, I think that's it. Yeah. So then, when it comes to your day to day, like, what does that look like? Are you finding brands to contact are you like physically contacting those brands are you pitching them what what does your day-to-day -day look like when it comes to the wholesale business 
Um, well, one third of my day is still working my remote job on my because uh, I work a coding job on the side, and the rest of that day is mostly you know double checking my team's work on the OA side, make sure everything is like all good, um, giving feedback because they're they're I only recently outsourced the OA side, so the lead mm -hmm. review and like the purchasing I still have to. Um, review that work, make sure everything's running smoothly. I'm also repricing a good amount, and I'm still doing all the buying myself on the wholesale side. Like, so mm -hmm. I'm I'm making the POs. I'm deciding how much how much should we buy, and I'm also like looking. I'm also doing the sourcing on that side too. It's not it doesn't take a huge amount of my time, but then the rest of the time is really um, <clears throat> like right now we're not really looking for new brands. I think I, I am gonna start soon in like a week or two. I have right now my list is. Like thirty to fifty brands right now that I want to. I don't want to overload myself. I just want to like follow up for a while, you know, give it a few weeks and see what works, see what doesn't, and and I think I'm also spending some time like still learning the TikTok platform and like learning how to, you know, how should we how should we make videos, how should we position ourselves, um, how do we sell on these channels, right? So it's stuff I've never learned before, but uh. It's still doing a lot of learning, basically, and I'm also like I'm. Not, I just started reading that book, Traction. That, oh uh, yeah, you sent actually. It's it's a good one. I think it's I'm a really keep good one. It. That's I'm telling you what that's and so, so for those of you listening, he's talking about the book Traction, and the author is Gino Wickman, and so um, that's something that I I sent that book, and I think three more books to everybody that's in our mastermind community. So they got those in the mail, and that's the first one that I recommend people read because I've read a lot of books over the last few years and Traction is my number one business book by far. I've read it three or four times at this point and I try to read it at least two to three times a year. Um, it's it's just so good when it comes to knowing your KPIs, building out your scorecard, your you know your 90 day goals, your three year goals, your five year goals, your 10 year goals, just really, really good book for creating like an operating system for your company, right? I think that's that's the, biggest benefit when it comes to that book and now to kind of go back to what you said a second ago so you said you're doing a lot of the buying for the wholesale side of your business which is great right like i wouldn't recommend you hand that off at, at least especially unless you have somebody that's you know already trained that you can trust to do that but one of the big biggest pieces of advice that i would give you and i wish somebody had told me this like years ago is when you're when you're doing the buying, like when you're going through deciding how many to order, deciding what price to like offer, you know, just going through the buying process, I highly encourage you to record every single second of that, of you doing that and like talk it out loud, right? Because what I'm what I'm doing now, because I've got Criselda, my head of operation, she's doing a lot of our buying. Well, when she buys something or when she suggests that we buy something, I'm no longer just saying like, you know, hey, buy that or hey, buy 100 units of that. What I'm doing is I'm every time we go to place an order, I record myself using Loom, screen share, going through the products, ASIN by ASIN, one by one. And I say, OK, you recommended we buy 150 units of this product. This is our price. Well, I actually think we should buy 250 units and this is why. Right. Or. You said we should buy 100. I think that's a great number. And here's exactly why I agree with your suggestion. You see what I mean? So that way, from now on, she doesn't place an order until I've recorded that video and sent her that feedback. So she places the order and then she goes in and watches the video to get the feedback. So like, I'm just trying to give or trying to almost transplant my brain into the heads of my buyers. And if I had been recording all of the, that's, you know, that buying over the last like months and years, it would have been so much easier for me to do that. I'm trying to almost like play catch up at this point. So that would be just some like, I know you didn't ask for it, but some unsolicited advice to you um, going forward, I think. And also too, it's just good content, right? Like if you ever decide to put out content, you know, on a consistent basis, you can go in and obviously like redact the ASINs or redact the supplier names. It's just really good like footage to have kind of in your back pocket. Yeah, that's a really, really good piece of advice definitely will definitely need to do that if of course i plan on um delegating the the purchasing at some point so it, it only makes sense yeah and also too i mean if you've got a really good buyer like on the oa side and you've got well not i guess not technically buyers but more like sourcers uh if you've got three sources on the oa side i mean you know as well as i do like the actual like vetting process is very similar to that of wholesale so if, if one of those three is just like 
significantly better than the others or is just really good, it would be pretty easy to kind of peel them off to focus on more of the wholesale side. And you could just say like, hey, here's, you know, three months of videos of me explaining my thought process behind all these wholesale buys, watch them and then kind of adapt your style to these. And then I'll continue to provide you with those going forward. I, yeah, that's that's kind of how I would make the transition as far as like bringing a buyer on for the wholesale side. When it comes to the actual purchasing of your inventory, how are you financing? And I assume you're using credit cards for everything, right? Credit cards for everything. Right now we are on a Lending Street loan. Um, okay. We took it in November um, for about 150000 and it's a big reason why we were able to grow um, in a short amount of time. Um, so we are leveraging credit cards and that loan. Um, I think we did an Amazon loan last year, but it was not for very much. And I think part of why um, I was able to grow pretty quickly as well is, you know, I had a lot of leftover capital sitting around when I first got into Amazon. So that's that's definitely a big a big factor. Yeah, because I mean, everyone knows this is one of those businesses that like it takes money to make money, right? That's why when I hear people say like, hey, I want to get into wholesale, I want to transition from arbitrage to wholesale. Usually one of the first questions I ask is, okay, well, how much capital do you have available, right? Because listen, you can start wholesale with $2,000, $3,000. I mean, I've heard of people that literally started with like $1,000 or less and made it work and scaled it over time. But as you know, it's going to take so much longer to scale to any meaningful number if you have a little amount of capital starting out, right? Because this is one of those businesses where you spend you spend money to make money. The more you can spend, the more you're going to make. So that's why when people come to me and ask, how much do I need to start wholesale? I always say 5 to 10K for inventory minimum, right? Minimum. Now, that's in addition to like if you plan on buying a course or if you plan on paying for coaching, that's money for inventory and what you're going to spend on information or coaching is going to be separate. Right. Um, so I think, again, I, I like that you painted a realistic picture of, well, Hey, I scaled to almost 300 K a month in under two years, which is a lot faster than most people, but it's because you had some capital to invest going into it. Right. So what credit cards are you using? You say you, you took that industry loan, everything else is going on credit cards. Which ones are you using? Oh, this is the the sweet stuff. <laughs> no, yeah. but uh, so we for 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 buying, we're using the Trace Premier. Okay. Yep. We do have a good limit on it because I bank with Trace since like I was a kid, so uh, we have a pretty good limit on it. And for usually we we also have the Plum. Uh, if we need help with cash flow, we're using that for all our OA buys right now as well. And we're also using the Chase Business Unlimited, which is like one point five percent cash back on all purchases that's mainly for like software or logistics or any kind of random expenses mm -hmm. and we're also using, we recently got the amex gold as well for advertising yeah that's a good one uh four x four x points on on advertising spend and and actually software too which is kind of crazy so those are the main four cards that we use right now nice yeah those are all great ones we recently downgraded our amex platinum to an amex gold to get that ad spend the four four times points on the ad spend right because i mean the main benefit of the platinum is those travel benefits and if you're not doing a lot of travel which when I, mean, I do it just kind of in spurts but i'm not like someone who loves to travel and travels a lot so the amex at like i think 625 a year for the platinum the annual fee is just not worth it if, unless you're doing a ton of travel so i downgraded to the gold i got a refund on the annual annual fee because i'd already paid the platinum annual fee for the year and now i'm getting like you said the four times points on ad spend which we don't spend like a ton of money on ads but we'll spend a few thousand a month on ads mainly for our branded bundles and for some of the the products where we're exclusive with a couple of brands on and those that 4x points like that adds up right significantly mm. over time and I know uh, for inventory, we're using the Capital One Spark mainly because we just have a very high limit on that card. And then for other inventory spend, we're using that Chase Inc. Business Premier, two and a half percent on on orders over 5K. And the reason that's not our primary card is because we just don't have a very high limit. Chase has been very stingy with uh, giving us an increase there, unfortunately. But that's that's going to be your best bet by far for inventory spend because of how much you spend on inventory and how quickly that cash back adds up.
right? Yeah, no, it's crazy. Honestly, like if you have the if you have the capital, you know, it's the second paycheck, like cash back itself. It's, it's literally it's mind blowing. It's an entire. I mean, it's an entire like additional annual salary for some people. I mean, I know I was talking to. Uh, I guess I'll name drop him. Chris Potter, right? He runs Tall Oak Advisors. He's my bookkeeper. He he runs a company that does my bookkeeping. He about ten years ago was a very large wholesale seller, about eight figures per year. And he said there was a point where he was making over two hundred k in cash back per year from his credit card spend. And you know, some some bookkeepers will tell you one thing, some will tell you another. But his stance is that hey. That is in that is income that does not need to be reported. That just can kind of go straight into your pocket. So that's how I've been treating it. Every time my Capital One Spark, uh, I think every time the balance hits about five k, I cash it out because I'm. It's one of those things where like, I don't want to let it build up too much because I, you know they could take it away at any time or really do whatever they want. So my strategy is every time that cash back balance hits five k, I cash it out. I put it in my personal savings account, and that's that. Right. You do something similar. Just every month. Yeah. As soon as it's ready, I just withdraw every month. it. So, nice. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good strategy too. I just like, for whatever reason, I like it to hit that, that 5k mark, but that's a, that's a great strategy. So real quick, while I, uh, while we transition into the, the last part of this episode here, we'll go into what I call the lightning round, which is where I'm just going to ask you four super quick questions on, um, you know, your experience and a couple of things that have gotten you to where you are and then we'll call it. Does that sound good? Yeah. Sounds good. Awesome. So first question of the lightning round is what resource has been the most helpful to you in your Amazon journey? Now this could be free or paid. It could be a book, a course, a YouTube channel, anything along those lines that has helped you significantly on your journey. Well, oh, that's a tough one. That's a tough one. I think. Um, that's a, that's a really tough one. I have to think about it. Hold on. Uh, I'm trying to first, first, my first thought is fields of profit and flips for miles, YouTube channels. Like they, they put out so much good content um, oh, yeah. for new sellers. Uh, I want to say that one, honestly, um, if it wasn't that one, then number two would be fields of profits coaching program, which I don't think exists anymore, but that really, really helped me. And actually up there as well as your wholesale challenge. I did that in the last, last summer. Which is super super helpful. Very very like affordable, um, very very affordable course. To learning everything about wholesale um, all in one go, um, compared to any other wholesale course. Hundred percent, it's a very good resource. And well, honestly, those, those are my top three. I can't really pick one. Nice. Well, no, those are all good ones. And yeah, so shout out to Warner and Miles. I mean, they they're the ones that kind of convinced me to start creating content at, at scale as well. And they've got fantastic. YouTube channels, lots of really good free information on starting Amazon, especially when it comes to online arbitrage. So be sure to check them out uh, if you're listening to this and you haven't checked them out yet. So that's great. All right. So second question, who got you into selling on Amazon? Was it a content creator? Was it a friend? Who kind of brought this opportunity to you? All right. So I think I can pull up the video right now. I think it's how to make it was a PL, it was a PL video. Oh, nice. Yeah, let's see it. I think it was like a Oh damn it! I was like, it was like a six-hour YouTube video on, on, on private label. I, I can't really I forgot his name. It was about it had to do with like Jungle Scout. It's like six hours long. Uh, I can't find it anyway. It was just like some PL video. You know, they went into like literally everything about PL. They used Jungle Scout, Helium Ten. You know, do your product research. So that's that's like kind of how I got into it. You know, they pitched like, do you want to be, do you want to be uh, financially free? Like they pitched all that kind of cliche stuff right. so i got baited but like i kind of quickly realized before i spent too much money that wow this is pretty risky i don't know anything. yeah so that's yeah i mean I PLs, like, PLs it came to my senses risky. right so i was like why would i do this i should i should do something that makes you know it's very low risk that's how I, I started like a retail arbitrage for my first two or three weeks and you know you don't have to spend any money to get a proof of concept uh if you do if you start by retail or online arbitrage like you don't have to spend that much money that's right. why it's so easy to start. Yeah, no, I love that. That's great. I, I've heard a lot. We've had a lot of previous guests say that they started, that they either like saw a private label ad or saw a private label video and then kind of came to the same realization that you did. It's like, well, there's a less risky way to start. So I think that's that's common among some folks that have been on the show. All right. So third question, what is your number one business goal right now? 
and how do you plan to accomplish it? Our one number one business goal is to land our first brand direct deal. And we want to we want to expand that to at least five brand direct deals um, for a lot of reasons. Um, long term game, it's going to be safer selling on the Amazon platform and any other marketplace as well. If you have if you're our partner with these brands, you know, you're pretty much set for like selling online, basically. Like you if you if you do a good job. You know, there's nothing that stops you, right? Amazon comes with a lot of issues, right? Like listings getting deleted or IP complaints or inauthentic complaints. Like there's a lot of uh, inventory leakage. Of course, that some issues aren't related to being brand direct, but brand, being brand direct is, for me, the, the number one long-term game. Awesome. Well, last question of the lightning round. What is your number one tip for new wholesale sellers? Uh, for new wholesale sellers, I would say, I mean, you just, if you're already doing whole, if you're, do, if you're just starting at wholesale, I would actually recommend to do OA first. Just, you don't have to do it to make money. I would say do it for like a month, kind of understand the Amazon process, like shipping and MV, FBA shipments, know how to, you know, all, all man, even, manage your inventory, get a repricer, know all these aspects of your business that, are super super important, and once you do, once you do know, then you can start pivoting to wholesale. Make a time every day, build a list of distributors and brands. Ideally, brands or distributors that you already sell through OA. This is easiest, mm -hmm. and I mean, really, it's just a numbers game. I mean, ninety for me, like ninety. I want to say nine, between ninety-five to ninety-eight percent of the suppliers I look at or have called, either you know they're not a good fit, they look fishy, or they're not profitable. That's they fall for me that they fall into that 95 to 98 percent range. So you just need to find those one, literally one to like we only buy from like one to two suppliers right now, and we're doing this much revenue. And really, you only need like two or three. That's how I see it. You only need two or three good suppliers. That's such you a have, good tip. You have to contact like tip. hundreds, or look for. You have to look at hundreds most likely. Like you will, you most definitely have to look at hundreds before you find that one good one. Yep, that's. I think that's such great advice, right? And I mean we. You know, if we like, we mainly buy from probably five to eight main suppliers. But if we wanted to, we, I mean, we, some of our suppliers, they're so good that we could literally spend all of our money with one or two of them, right? If we wanted to. So it, it truly, it, you're like, you're one to two suppliers away from completely changing your business. I couldn't agree more. I agree. It's just, it, it sounds easy if you look at it that way, but really, it's, it's going to take a lot of hours to find those. So it's not, it's not easy by any means. Yep, agreed. Well, hey man, great conversation. So before we jump, where can people find out more about you? Just Keith underscore FBA on Twitter. Well, you heard it there, guys. Follow him, Keith underscore FBA on Twitter. You can follow me on Twitter at Ganim Corey. I'm at Corey Ganim on every other platform. So thank you so much for watching. And I'll be back next week with a new episode. So thank you, Keith. Yeah, thanks for having me.